Okay, we're right now we're sitting with Cami Garcia. The, the, her new book is Unmarked. It's the latest in the Legion series. You're also the author of the Beautiful Creatures series with Margaret Stoll. Welcome to PBS at the Mind Thanks Book Fair International. Me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's wonderful. So let's first talk about your new book. This is the, a book that you're writing on your own without Margaret. What's it like kind of going solo and writing your own series? Um, it's really fun to write by myself, but it is much harder because you know, when you have a writing partner, you have, you never get stuck. There's no writer's block. You just send it on to the other person. And you also get feedback all the time. So you know if you're on the right track and you know if what you're doing is resonating with someone. When you're writing by yourself, I didn't realize since I learned to write basically with Margaret, you write, you know, 100 pages before anyone sees it and you have no idea if they're terrible. Right. Like, you know, you have no, I mean, I read, you know, I've read to my husband, but he is my husband, you know, he has, to, he has to love it on some level. And you really, like the self-doubt comes in at a much bigger level than when you have another person. Even after all these books you've written now, the self-doubt is still there. Even when we write together, I mean, we have to talk each other off the ledge. You know, I'll be writing a scene and I'll say like, it's horrible, it need, we just need to pick something else and re-outline, it's never gonna work. And she'll be like, what are you talking about? It's like 90% there, it's fantastic. I think most writers struggle with self-doubt, you know, and I don't know if it's part of being a writer. Maybe that's what attracts us. I mean, it is kind of a very isolated field. You're alone, you're with your, you're, you're in your head, but the, the sad part of that is you have to listen to what's in your head too. That's right. And it's not always the characters. That's right, so you jumped out of the nest and you're writing on your own. So do you feel like that's been a, a cool growing process for you, like not to have that crutch of like, no, it's good, it is good, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, it was It was really hard with um, with Unbreakable, with the first book in the Legion series, because that was my first time out, aside from writing short stories by myself. And once I did that, I kind of knew I could do it. But then Margie and I also started writing the Dangerous Creatures uh, book, which was the spinoff of Beautiful Creatures, while I was writing Unmarked. So then it was really difficult because I got that like fantastic kind of, you know, kismet going again, where I'd send it to her, she'd send it to me, and I was like, oh, this is so great. And then I had to go back to my own, you know, solo book, and I was like, oh, there's so many scenes left to write, so many pages, and it, in a way, it was like I got spoiled again. Yeah. And so then I was really overwhelmed, and I was a little bit late turning it in. You talk about beautiful creatures and, and how that was an accidental book. What does that mean exactly? Um, beautiful Creatures, we wrote Beautiful Creatures on a dare from seven teenagers in my fantasy book club. Two of Margie's daughters, her two oldest daughters, and my much, much younger sister. And I was an elementary school teacher, that's how we met. I taught Margie's, um, all of her daughters, but when her oldest daughter was in my class, we became really good friends. And I started teaching a fantasy book club at her house. It was um, two boys and five girls. And we read books all the time. And it was before, like Hunger Games hadn't come out yet. I think the second Twilight book was out. And at that time it was a lot of vampires. And they loved Twilight, they loved all those books, but they were like, we really want something different, something new. Why doesn't someone do something new? And the girls kept saying, you know, all these books, the boy is always the powerful supernatural. And the girl just gets to like fall in love and get rescued. Why can't the girl do something cool? And Margie and I went out to our favorite Mexican restaurant, like mulling this over and talking about it and drinking Diet Coke. And, you know, I, I mean, I wrote poetry. I was a visual artist. She's, you know, designed video games. She always wanted to be a writer. And so we started batting around ideas, like how would we do it? Why don't people create supernaturals? Like that would be the most fun part. And we came up with all these ideas, wrote them on a napkin. She went back home and she told her oldest daughter, you know, Mrs. Garcia and I are gonna write a book. And her daughter was kind of like, yeah, whatever. And she pitched her, you know, the idea what we come up with. And her daughter didn't really give her the reaction she was hoping for. And she's like, you don't, like, don't you think that's an awesome idea? And she was like, yeah, but you'll never do it because you never finish anything. And in terms of books, that was true. Murray had a yeah. lot of chapter ones. Right, so you, you acknowledge that was true for her. That, well, yeah. she did too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so she called me up and she said, you know that thing we were talking about that we probably weren't gonna do, we have to do it now. Yeah. And teachers finish everything. So I was like, okay. Yeah, threw down the gauntlet. But we didn't, do it. Like, we didn't think we were writing a book. To us, we were writing a story, mm -hmm. you know, a long, like a story. For readers outside of your friends and family or? or no, for these 17. Oh, okay. And so we wrote, um, 
we actually wrote it like serialized fiction. Uh -huh. Every day we would write, every night we write chapters, and in the morning we'd give them to the teens so that they could put them on their computer before they went to school. And, you know, the next, as soon as they got home, they'd be like, make sure, you know, do you have new chapters? Are you guys working? They would message us. And it started going virally through their friends and then a couple other high schools where all of my former students, you know, had moved on to. And Margie got a message from a girl like we didn't know on Facebook one night named Joyce, who was like, you know, went to one of those schools and she said, like, I only have up to page 140, like, I need more pages. And she was like, this is like a thing. So, but we still thought of it as like a story. We were just so excited that anyone was reading it and anyone liked it because we were loving writing it. And when we were done, I mean, like for me, the most important thing, of course, was we won the bet. And we also, uh, when she read the end of the book, um, her oldest daughter, who is kind of like a tough girl, uh, cried. So I was like, yes, that's like the, we made, you know, young teenager yeah, cry. Worked. That was a good prize. And uh, Margie's really good friend um, is the, the middle grade author, Pseudonymous Bosch, and they've known each other since junior high. And he was really interested in what we're up to also, and so he'd been reading it, and we came up with a brilliant idea. We were gonna make a website and put the story up online for everyone to read for free. And um, we didn't know anything about publishing, let alone self-publishing. Yeah, you weren't even thinking about it then. You are just like, let's no, we were, and we didn't even know like you could self-publish a book, really. I mean, we had no idea what we were doing. Right. And he said, you two are idiots. Please do not do that. And he sent it to his agent in New York without telling us. And that's how we got an agent. And we stumbled our way through the entire publishing process of that book. We didn't, you know, we didn't know the terminology and the jargon of the publishing industry. And we were always scared to ask questions because we didn't want anyone to know that we had no idea what we were doing. And eventually, like, our agent caught on and she would be like, ladies, do we really know what this means? And we'd be like, no, not really. Like, they, you know, the advanced reading copies that they send out that they call ARCs. I right. remember they said, yeah. uh, you know, there's, they're going to make ARCs. And there was, like, silence. And our agent said, do, do you know what arcs are? And I was like, well, I'm assuming you're not talking about, you know, the boat with the animals. And she was, <laughs> but it was always like yeah. that. Well, so you go from not knowing anything about the publishing yeah. world to now being this, you know, huge best-selling author, you've become much more savvy, but the expectations that come along with that are really challenging too. Yeah, um, especially when your first book, Beautiful Creatures, I mean, I always tell people, you know, it was a lot of the right place at the right time, you know, luck. There's a lot of amazing books that never get any attention. Right. So when books do, I think it's a great combination of timing and the readers finding it and the publisher doing a good job. Beautiful Creatures, you know, it was like Amazon's number one teen book. It was number five on the all around list. It got optioned before it came out by mm -hmm. Warner Brothers, which was like a big deal. And made into a movie. And yeah, I mean, well, but not then. Yeah. But all these things, you know, got nominated for the William Morris Award, the right. ALA Award. All these crazy things were happening to it. And it is it is intimidating because even writing the second one, we right. were like, what if everyone thinks the second one is awful? Yeah. Like, how do you, you know, how do you live up to that? Right. Because it was literally like the perfect storm. Right, it's a challenge. You were a school teacher um, before this for 17 years, um, and you've seen readers, and now you've, you know, as you think to your own reading days, and you think about what you're helping to do with, you know, young readers today, um, how do you keep readers? So once you hook them with a book like yours, how do you keep them reading well into their life? I mean, we, we find that we lose a lot of readers later after they, you know, get in older and their life starts to get busier. And yeah, I was going to say, it's very difficult in high school because they are overwhelmed with work and things that they have to read. And, you know, I feel like as time goes on, they have less and less free time. We're, you know, I mean, we're, we're basically pushing them into college yeah. when they're in high school. I tutored a lot of high school students. Uh, I think that the trick is always, my, one of the things I loved, I built classroom libraries and I was always the one who'd like find you the right book. I was secretly think I wanted to be a librarian. And um, I think it's all about like finding, you know, like I, if I would find out like what is, what is a kid like, especially like a reluctant reader or someone who struggles with reading where uh -huh. it's not fun. And if they loved, you know, skateboarding, we would get like Tony Hawk's autobiography, you know, and we would get books about extreme sports and skateboarding. A lot of boys, um, you know, we'll get hooked with nonfiction first. Like my son loves nonfiction. And then now he reads chapter books, but in the beginning it was all like, you know, construction machines and, you know, animals. He wasn't interested at all in reading fiction unless I read it to him. Right. But I think that, uh, I think that as kids get older, it's really, I mean, I feel like it, teachers need to give them time to actually read something. 
And I think that, you know, they also need help like finding a book to really hold their attention and that they want to read. There's so much that they have to read that they don't want to read is the right. problem. So in schools today, you're seeing that all the time. These kids come home with all these stacks of books and they're the classics or in some cases they're new classics. Um, would you recommend just letting them just go to town and giving them 10 books or how do you do it? I mean, you well, got to pull them in and pull them further down the path yeah. of reading. I love the classics. I One thing that I was really impressed with um, when we were doing the Beautiful Creatures tours was because the book is clean, you know, there's no like profanity, mm -hmm. everyone keeps their clothes on. It's actually taught in a lot of schools and we saw them teaching it as comparative lit to To Kill a Mockingbird because To Kill a Mockingbird is featured in the book because right. um, we kind of deal with, you know, supernatural discrimination, but they use it as comparative literature and I can see you know, the possibility of doing that with a lot of books. You know, The Giver matches up to tons of dystopian books. In, um, Brave New World. I think sometimes if you find a way to make it more accessible and fun, they have a lot of amazing graphic novels of, of Shakespeare. And, you know, when I was tutoring some of the kids, I found that if we read that first and they understood the story, then when they were reading it, you know, the original, it wasn't it wasn't as hard to muddle through because at least they felt like they like they could picture that scene or they understood why it was important and exciting. Right. You know, so I think that there's a lot of creative ways but you do have to you have to go the extra mile. And there are a lot of teachers that do that. Yeah. But if you don't, it's not as fun. Well, I'm glad that you're helping them along the path. Cami Garcia, the new book is unmarked. It's part of the new Legion or the Legion series, the second book. And you have, of course, the Castor Chronicles, the Beautiful Creatures books, which are phenomenal bestsellers. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was wonderful.